Welcome to Crossing the Chasm. I'm delighted to introduce my first guest, Jessica Alvarez Parfrey. Jessica has a background in community organizing, nonprofit fundraising, and environmental activism, formerly with Greenpeace USA. She finds joy in seeking transformative opportunities for radical collaboration and community co creation. She's worked on food, housing, community health and wellness, and other issues. She's a lifelong learner of all things that would allow us to reimagine our relationship to the earth and to one another. She is a mother. She's creative, she's a caretaker of 44 acres of land, and is a Jedi consultant working in service to the project of collaborative liberation. She received her BA in environmental studies from the University of California at Santa Barbara, and is driven to nurture opportunities for joy, healing, community-based strategy, and design informed by decolonized practice and methodologies. She is currently the executive director of Transition USA. I think you're really going to enjoy this conversation. Jessica Alvarez Parfrey, thank you so much for joining me on Crossing the Chasm. I'm so delighted to be here. Thanks, Brian, for the invitation. Well, I've been looking forward to this. This is the first episode. I'm super excited to talk with you. Really interested in the work you're doing. And I guess to start, I wanted to just uh, reflect broadly. You know, this uh, podcast is called Crossing the Chasm, and and that kind of refers to the fact that we have on the one hand, all these problems. On the other hand, we kind of know what we need to do. It's just getting to that point. And so I'm really curious from your perspective, how do you see the chasm or chasms in our society? Ooh, that's a deep question. That's also meant to be kind of a funny response. Um, you know what comes to mind? I don't know why I'm thinking about those, those Looney Tunes uh, or like the characters crossing over a cliff and they're walking along just fine. And then they look down beneath them and they're like, Oh no. And then that's when they fall or a scene from, I think Indiana Jones where he's doing a similar thing and kind of has to have faith in that he's reading from this codex correctly and that he can take these steps forward. So I think the chasms are, I don't know, places where we have really deep questions uncertainty, fear. Um, these are also the places where we have the most promise and potential, the most excitement, at least for me. Um, so the chasms that I'm looking a lot at right now are just how do we reclaim our relationships um, to planet, to people, to place, and really looking at kind of the deep roots, doing some radical reflection as to where this kind of separation really come from and it's some it's some deep stuff i'm also really interested in balancing this outer work around how we kind of organize our society how we mobilize but also with that inner that inner piece some deep stuff um and (laughs) i'm like i don't know if i'm making sense here but the chasm again is just (sighs) these leaps of faith that we need to take um and again it comes back to relationship for me so trusting in the capacities for collective transformation, really sitting with the fact that community isn't just a thing we're entitled to. It's something that we actively have to build. Um, We actively have to um, interrogate and reimagine. Um, And a big part of that work, I think, is contained, for me at least, uh, in healing. So... A lot of the designs of the institutions that have a lot of the decision-making power or influence in our current modern, postmodern mega design that we have going on here, um, they're informed by a particular kind of logic and orientation to the world. And that narrowing, I think, has cost us quite a bit. So I think the chasms, again, are like, how do we unlearn? How do we reconceptualize? How do we center relationships? Um, in an increasingly complex and overwhelming time. At least that, those are just kind of some of the threads that come to mind as I sit with that question, what it means to cross the chasm. Um, yeah. And also belief <laughs> in a future, um, that, that a positive future is possible because uh, it can be easy to get caught in those dark places where we're like, 
you know, can, can we get to the next step? One other thing that stands out from that um, description, which I loved, is this notion of community and that you're arguing that it needs to be built. I think many people would suggest that they just live in a community. It's already preconceived. Why is it that people feel that way? And why do you think it's important to reconceptualize that as a, a, ne- a necessary step as, as actually creating community? So I'm sitting outside right here in this beautiful, I guess you would describe it, suburb. For me, it feels extremely rural, having lived in more, you know, having lived in, in, you know, cities like L.A. And I'm just sitting with the fact that I know some of my neighbors, but not all of them. And I think that can often be the case for a lot of us where we, again, we can like move to a place, we can claim a state, we can say we were born in a particular city, but that sense of community, for me at least, has always come from a place of like shared struggle shared joy. Um, and that, that requires work, that requires vulnerability, that requires putting yourself out there. And, um, you know, I think we've, in a lot of, in a lot of ways, we've lost that, that sense of connection. And I think what I see so often in the transition movement are folks who are really committed to reclaiming relationality and relationship. And that, that echoes from relationship to place and again, the people that make these communities happen. Um, it's a dynamic living thing. Um, it's just not a, it's not just the neighborhood that you live in. If you don't know anybody, who is your community? And I'm thinking about it a lot, you know, living, living here in California with, with wildfires. So when we have disasters happen here, it's interesting that that's when you often see some of the most powerful expressions of community come 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 out is when folks are in that kind of state of like needing to survive and then there's this this beautiful kind of trust that can happen where we believe we can actually look out for each other we can get through this and um, there's been some amazing work that I've been able to um, learn about here um, singing specifically of cooperation humble um, who's a, they're a transition initiative and so much more. They're deeply inspired by the work of Cooperation Jackson out of Jackson, Mississippi. They're doing some amazing community building work there. And just the way in which folks here in, in, in Humboldt were able to mobilize hundreds of volunteers, do, um, you know, food distribution efforts, um, really just kind of supporting and offering um, opportunities to connect and to yeah, to, again, to heal. Um, there's some, a really wonderful write-up about this work on our website, but I'm just thinking about that, that community community comes with um, responsibility and sacrifice often. And it is one of the most beautiful things that I can have ever participated in or have ever bared witness to, honestly. What do you think are the factors that have led to a, a decline, basically, or disconnection in our society? Why don't we have stronger communities? Hmm. Well, I think about that. Um, the fact that a lot of households are now dual income households, um, the amount of time that folks have to spend working just to meet their basic needs. I think another aspect, I don't know, I, I think about this a lot with social media and just like how it has enabled a lot of really beautiful connectivity. And then it also like perpetuates the echo chamber kind of effect. Um, and maybe lack of trust and disconnect and also the greater kind of political, yeah, um, polarization that we're seeing right now. I, uh, what, (laughs) such a, such a big question. Yeah. I don't, I, I, I think, I think reclaiming again, that, that relationship to place is something that I'm seeing contributing to the healing of that disconnect. Um, and that's the work that I'm really invested in too, is having community-based development be informed very much by the ecologies, the histories of a place, um, and really, again, serve that, that, that greater healing project. And I think that's where I think a lot of things come to the surface as to why we've had some, some disconnects that have really intensified in this time. And I I think, I think of families who are, <laughs> who have, um, like stopped talking to each other, for example, because they can't talk about politics. 
there's always that rule, like, don't talk about politics or religion at the table, but it's, it's really intensified. So if anything, I'm trying to see more of the solution instead of focusing on the problem. It's like, yes, I think there is a disconnect. I think there's been a lot of factors that contributed to community cohesion um, and relationship that have maybe been eroded away or lost. Um, displacement of entire communities and cultural, um, you know, cu- cultural networks, care networks. Yeah, there's a lot of shift. But I think when I see folks kind of coming together and trying to reclaim that relationality, um, they want to make more space for that conversation so we can really get to the root of it. Why are we disconnected from each other? Why are we disconnected from the earth? Why are we disconnected from one another? And what is it that actually keeps us together? Yeah, I really love how you talked about that. I mean, connection is one of the main focal areas of this podcast. So this really resonates. And I love your descriptions. And I love the fact that you're uh, suggesting that we, you know, we, we can focus on why it's happening, but it's really important to move forward. So this issue of place is really striking to me. I'm curious if you could say a little bit more about, yeah, the ways in which maybe in your own life connection has been generated in, in this way of thinking about place and, and connecting with place as a mechanism to bind people together. For sure. Yeah, I, so I, I, I've been doing a bit of work in my own personal life, just kind of tracing family stories, uh, genealogies, ancestries. And again, going back to that point about healing, I think that is something that just kind of really struck me, that need to reconnect with those stories to make sense of the now. And again, on a personal level, just make better sense of what it is I'm kind of being called to do and how can I most effectively serve community? How can I most effectively serve place? So place for me is not just, uh, you know, somewhere you can stick stick a flag on a Google map. Place also has to do with, with time as well. So again, those histories are really important. And I think about that within this larger context of the United States and just, you know, even saying that the United States, their entire ways of recognizing the land that do not use those words, their indigenous sacred places, we're all, we're all on native land, essentially, is what I'm trying to get at. I think really reconciling with that history of genocide, with displacement, is super important in this work. Um, And that that definitely connects to this focus on on climate, with some folks tracing, you know, the industrial era as kind of being the, the point of escalation. And, you know, we can go back even further to the impacts of colonization being the real catalyst for climate change and the way that we are understanding it now. And it's because we've lost, we've lost our sense of relationship to place and what our place is on, if you want to think about it on another level, what our place is in this web of relationships. I think we've gotten lost. So it's important to know where we've been so that we can know where we're going, if that makes sense. Oh, that makes perfect sense. And it sounds to me like what you're describing has really in, influenced what you're doing in your life and, and your career and, and where you've gone. What is it about the transition network that draws you and links to these issues that you're talking about? Mm. Mm. What I really love about the transition network is that it very much centers learning. It centers a very holistic approach to being within ourselves and really coming into ourselves as an effective agent of change. And so one of the one of the levels that I think the transition network has focused a lot of its work on is is at a neighborhood level. So like I was mentioning earlier, <laughs> that a lot of that work was very much informed by the fact that hey, most people don't actually really know their neighbors. Maybe we should start there. And I think that, yeah, that serves to remind us of what our, what is our locus of control or influence? What can we really affect change over? And the answer, 
which I think is always quite reassuring, is it's a lot more than what we actually think or what we've been led to believe. And there is this beauty and emergence that I think is very much honored within transition across the planet. I believe there's over a thousand initiatives distributed in various countries. So I think that's what's really beautiful. It's this living, living, learning laboratory, this network across the planet. And it's just, you know, everyday folks, some of them may be doctors, maybe researchers, moms, dads, like just everybody who has an interest in community and are really sitting in that recognition of, hey, things are things are kind of broken and things actually need to get a lot better like now. So how, how do we do that? And there's a really beautiful Rob Hopkins quote, Rob Hopkins being the founder of Transition, started out of Totnes, England, and I believe it was incubated in a community college course and is focused on permaculture. But his quote being like, if we wait for the government, it's not going to, it's not going to happen. If we just tr- try to do it as individuals, it's not going to be enough. But if we do it as communities, it might be just enough just in time and I think every time we engage in that community building work like I'm always blown away by what is actually revealing itself to be possible and I think sustaining that those relationships sustaining that sacred space of potentiality and 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 progress forward motion is really important I want to get to the transition network and the the details of that in a moment but before we do that I want to reflect on something you just mentioned, which is that idea of starting local. I mean, some people would suggest that, you know, climate change as an example is this global problem. The only way it can be solved is through global international action. Your all's work takes a different perspective and says starting at the local level actually is the place to do it. How can local actions address something like a global problem like climate change? I think that's a, I think that's a great question. So I also think Yeah, I want to go back to that point about transition being very much holistic in terms of its orientation. So recognizing kind of this fractal fractal relationship with the micro and the macro and finding kind of those edges and emergent, emergent points of influence where we can move across scales in really beautiful ways. And I'm also thinking of the work of um, Daniel Christian Wall. Uh, he wrote Regener- Designing Regenerative Cultures and talks a lot about the regional or bioregional scale, which is actually a scale that we're really interested in right now, but still taking a look at what is the local, what does the local even mean, right? Is it your immediate neighborhood? Is it your immediate um, municipality, your county? Well, it's always all of them all at the same time, right? So we're focusing our influence at this first level of the personal and the, the personal and the, um, you know, your neighborhood kind of level of influence, I guess, but also recognizing we need to be building relationships and pathways across those scales. So can neighborhoods organize themselves effectively to show up to a city council meeting to affect policy change that say translates into a climate change resilience strategy? that the community has real influence over and by in. And then can that work influence another municipality and maybe that creates some kind of collaborative partnership where best practices are shared and, and other insights. And again, that focus on relationship building. So I'd say it's always a both and approach and it's not like we're sacrificing the global for the sake of the local. You got to do them all at the same time, but it's the question of knowing where to and how to um, how to stack those relationships in a really smart way. I guess I want to go back to something else you said, which is related to this, which is individuals as agents of change. And that, that speaks to this issue of scale in some ways. What can an individual do? Can you say a little bit about your how you how you think about social change, what social change is, how it happens and how individuals are immersed in that? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I just So thinking about the human species and kind of our inherent design and inclination towards collaboration on some level, that we want to create communities, we want to create societies. This is an inherent part of who we are. 
And I think social change comes from recognizing that my idea of myself has been very much informed by and enabled by all of these networks of relationships, which I think also helps us to, I mean, we can get into deconstructing kind of the Western worldview and orientation and kind of the different philosophies that help to kind of put us at the center of everything and put us in a position of having dominion over the natural world. And I think what we're really looking to, again, is to, to push past that and to reclaim this knowledge that indigenous peoples have. <laughs> they, they, they're like, we get it. You, you all need to remember that this is all connected. So when I look at myself, I can also look at, I mean, I can give the example of going into my email and I can access an address book of amazing human beings who I've had the opportunity to come in contact with, share ideas, really have transformative conversations, you know, that really have shifted my life trajectory. I can honor that. I can honor that I am com coming from lineages of people who have navigated different struggles, have had different gifts, different ways of contributing and really impacting others. So again, it's, it's more of just this, for me at least, it's, it's, a, it's a way of being. Social change is like what we're here to do. And really recognizing what do I uniquely have to offer and how does that work compatibly and in support of what others have to uniquely offer and contribute during this time as well. If you are speaking to someone, because you referred to this a bit earlier, that a lot of people aren't engaged, they don't think they can, they don't think they can do anything. All of that really resonates. I'm wondering how, when you're speaking to people who have that orientation, that feel like they can't do anything, that their individual lives don't matter in terms of changing global processes and so forth. Yeah, what do you say to them that in, in ways that resonate so they actually do see the potential for themselves to make change? Yeah, I think usually starting off with what are you passionate about? What are you already doing and invested in? Right? So if folks are sitting with the immensity of how do I personally address climate change and solve all of the horrible things that I see going across my Facebook feed or on Instagram, you know, I, I think, <laughs> I think we need to give ourselves some grace, but this also connects to just like effective strategies for, for resilience during these times. So starting off with what are folks already giving the best of themselves to right now. And then I like to think about, you know, and it, again, this is like that relationship building work. And I used to do canvassing for Greenpeace, for example. And we used to canvass up and down the state of California and usually stand outside of, of grocery stores and try to stop people, random people going about their day. Hey, do you have a minute for the environment? Hey, you care about all any number of ways to stop people. And it was just fascinating. It was one of the best sociological experiments I've ever gotten to be a part of. But also there were conversations where it would start off with someone being like, you guys aren't going to do anything or, you know, this and this is, a, you know, an obstacle or it was someone who personally didn't believe in uh, – <laughs> The fact that climate change was even happening, that we would get some of those conversations. But when you really sat and created space for another human being who is infinitely complex, and you're like, so what are you into? What are you about? That's when you can make the most headway. So I think what I'm also advocating for and what I see represented within transition is how do we create those spaces for folks to really feel supported and like they can actually give something. So I think what you're saying is great, but it's never going to be fully addressed. I think in the conversation, it needs to be, we need to create the, we need to create the container. We need to create community around these things, but we can offer folks practical, you know, practical ways that they can contribute in their community ways to organize, let's say a petition to draw 
uh, attention to a particular issue that they may have. There be, you know, we can show um, folks how to grow food to try to move themselves towards greater resilience. We can show folks how to facilitate an effective meeting so that, again, they can create effective space to have complex conversations and really allow people to bring in their full selves. So the work is deep. I don't think it's going to ever be, we're not going to create the scale (laughs) and the intensity of the mobilization that we need unless we dig deep. And I think that's kind of the tension that we often feel when, you know, we're caught up in our everyday. It's just like, how do you step out of that? How do you, how do you unsettle yourself from the status quo, but create enough safety and support so that you can actively be actively build this, this world that you're trying to describe to people, the one that we all kind of know in our gut could be possible and that we kind of love and believe in, but you know, for whatever reason, sometimes we're made to feel like it's not possible and that we, that we can't contribute to it. So it's important. I don't know, <laughs> I don't know if that answers your question, but I'm like, I would tell people, here's a toolkit, here are things that you can do. And, in order to really get to the place of change that we all need, it's going to have to be a lot more than that. And that's going to require trust. That's really going to require time and, and community building, like I, like I mentioned earlier. A lot of people might say or think that they don't have time, that there's just not enough um, hours in the day. What I hear you saying, I think, is that people could look at this slightly differently. And, and the work that you're describing actually sounds like it could be quite enriching. Yeah, I think that's what I look for. If I'm entering a project space or I'm trying to work on a problem, I do think it's important to to make to to create ways in which we can come out of it healed. We can feel more connected. We can feel um, like maybe a load has been lessened because we've been able to share of ourselves a bit more deeply in community. We've gotten amazing feedback. Um, from folks who have participated in different transition projects, that it has literally changed their life and their way of looking at at the type of role they can play in their own community. So folks who didn't see themselves as organizers in any way, shape, or form come out of the other end of having done some transition work, feeling so much more confident, feeling connected, and then feeling like they can even share what they've learned with others. So again, it goes back to that importance of centering kind of the learning process and all of this. So that is ultimately enriching and we want people to feel joy in doing this work. So, you know, celebration is a really important part of transition culture as well. Celebrating the small wins, you know, making space for grief. Is that something that, that needs to be honored as well? And it's honestly like, it's a, it's a human healing project (laughs) as much as it is a, a planet healing project. You've been describing this in broad terms, which is really helpful to set the stage for these next set of questions, which really get to what is transition? How do you describe it? I mean, you have a website, people could look at that and get the overall details, but how how do you describe it and and what sort of is the embodiment of transition? Yeah, if I were to give you kind of our basic boilerplate, I would describe it as like a network of communities coming together to reimagine and rebuild our world. And that reimagining and that rebuilding is coming from a context of, you know, climate change, recognizing that we need to seriously decrease our dependency on fossil fuels, that we need to heal our soil, any number of projects. So I think that's the other, the other piece of advice that's usually given, that there isn't like an easy kind of elevator pitch for transition. It touches on, on every aspect of what we need to create resilient and regenerative communities in the face of unprecedented social and ecological crisis. So there are lots of other groups uh, that are working on similar issues around climate change or food production, social justice in different ways. Mm -hmm. So how are those, or I guess, what's the difference? What, how is transition different? Is it that there's a connection between all of that work? Is it a different goal? Is there a network? How, how would you characterize that difference? I think Yeah, I think that's something we've been really sitting with um, as an organization. So I'm the executive director for Transition US, which is the international hub here uh, for the International Transition Towns Movement. 
And yeah, I mean, we have amazing opportunities to tap into learning and, you know, projects and different frameworks that have been generated all over the world. And in the U.S., we've been really sitting with the fact that there are amazing other organizations and opportunities for folks to get involved and do this work. So how does Transition U.S. in this time kind of act as the most effective partner within this larger ecosystem of change? And, um, you know, I think that's actually a really beautiful part that transition is going to look different in every part of this country. So we have some groups like, you, you know, that focus maybe on food. Some other groups are trying to figure out questions around affordable housing. So, you know, some groups are finding that they're really effective at being conveners so that they can find willing, willing folk, volunteers to support efforts of groups, let's say, 350 or Sunrise or something like that. So again, I think we're really sitting with how do we put it all together? It's not like the transition brand or any other organization that's doing this kind of work is going to be the one to push us through. Like the, the real challenge is how do we leverage what we're all bringing to the table and what we're all bringing, honestly, are, are people, our learning and our relationships. And then how do we use all of that to build what it is we're always talking about? I can imagine that um, that also might bring some competition into this. That, that is to say that some groups might want not to actually participate in connection precisely because they want to have their own brand or, you know, have their own space, basically. Are, are you seeing that as an outcome or the opposite? That is to say that this framework you all have is actually leading to connections across different organizations and groups that's really productive. Um, I think, yeah, it, it would be honest of me to say that there's many different kinds of things happening across the network. So some groups have, you know, joined forces and actually mutated into another organization. Some folks had also, yeah, found that the community that was willing to participate in these kinds of groups was being spread thin. And um, (laughs) so, yeah, just going, I guess, back to your question, the competition piece, like we're a 501c3 organization and we're operating within the nonprofit industrial complex. So by, by we have to, in a sense, compete with other nonprofits for resources and for funding. And so I'm really inspired by different networks that are like, hey, we really need to shift this competition mode because we're talking against, we're, we're speaking out against that kind of paradigm, you know, and addressing questions around capitalism. How do we, how do we bring that in our work as, as part of the nonprofit world. And so going out more collaboratively for funding opportunities and really encouraging groups to share across different organizations and uh, issue areas, I think is really, really important. So yeah, there's a lot of different things happening out there. And it's always, again, an opportunity to learn and uh, to share what works and what doesn't. One of the primary impetuses for this podcast was to provide really concrete examples for people. Many people can't really envision something different or, you know, don't see a lot of alternatives as possibilities. You've mentioned a couple of topics already. I'm wondering, do you have any specific examples that could really ground this so that people, so that listeners could see, you know, what is happening on the ground and what are the consequences? Yeah, I think, again, I'm going to highlight the work of Cooperation Humble. And I'll mention a few other groups as well. So they have been building a really beautiful partnership with the Weop tribe up here. And um, the community up in the Humboldt area was able to kind of get organized and decide to provide opportunities to offer an honor tax. Um, So this would be an opportunity for folks who, you know, are not native (laughs) to this community. Um, to offer forward some, some, some support and some solidarity um, to the tribal community. So th- this has also happened on Ohlone land in, San- in the Bay Area with the Sogrea Tay Land Trust. Um, so they, they kind of followed suit. So they did an honor tax. They're also working on an indigenous-led community land trust. So they've been incubating a partnership there. And the former director and, and founder of Cooperation Humboldt, uh, David Cobb, who's amazing. He's now working as an employee of the of the WIAC community 
um, heading up their Dishkamu Humble, which I believe means love in the native language, to, to get a, a community land trust going where they can offer affordable housing, but the, the land is being held by, by the WIAT, um, which I think is really cool. In Pennsylvania, so we have Transition Town Media. They've been doing some really amazing work um, in solidarity with the uh, town of Chester, which is predominantly black population. Um, and they're very close to a waste um, incinerator. And so that's obviously have some environmental justice impacts on folks' respiratory health. So they've been organizing to stop that. They also have created a, a composting program. It was incubated by their group, and then they got buy-in from the municipality. So now it's a municipal composting program, which I think are really cool examples. Let's see. We have Transition Town Whalen that's been doing some really awesome organizing at more of a regional level. They've been doing some solarized projects, I believe, over the years. There's just so much, there's just a lot of richness in terms of the diversity of work that's happening. And what we're always looking at, because we're stewarding a network here of initiatives, again, operating on a subsidiary model, they kind of do what they need to do based on their needs, is how do we link those different efforts together to really unleash the opportunity that comes from peer-to-peer learning, again, sharing what works, what doesn't. Uh, there's often a lot of challenges around navigating things like conflict. This is real in almost any organizing space. How do we how do we deal with the yeah, there's just the different ways of being in the world that we're all coming with, different traumas, and you know how do we respond when that shows up in the work? Um, how do we make space for that and for again some kind of healing opportunity while we're also trying to organize our community. I don't know, to, to create more community gardens um, and, and advocate for more food, sovereignty, and, and resilience. Yeah, trying to think of some other examples. I'm also just really excited that Transition is part of the New Economy Coalition. I highly recommend that folks check out their work. This is like a 200-plus member coalition, again, from folks all over the country and I'm part of a few of their working groups. One of them is focused on regional organizing strategies. And this is made up of folks who are often working in cooperative development. So how do we, you know, if how do we create more opportunities for, for workers to, to be owners as well? Um, and I, I don't know if folks have been hearing about the, the unionizing work at Starbucks and the great, I think, resignation that's being called. Like we, you're seeing like, Folks want a different kind of relationship to work, and they 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 want to be treated well. And cooperatives offer a really viable model for folks to take a look at and even incubate. And there's a lot of great resources for again anyone who's like I'm just kind of a, an average person who's interested in, in contributing. They could learn what they need to learn to get some of these things up and running and contribute in that way if they want. So if a listener was uh, doing something in their own community and was piqued by this conversation and wanted to know more about transition, but also about the ways in which they might link their efforts to transition more directly, how, mm-hmm. how should they think about that and what might they do? That's a good, that's a good question. So um, we invite folks to, to check out our website, um, follow us on social media. We've been energizing our presence on on Instagram because having visual ways of representing the work on the ground, who we are in terms of transition, like who are the people behind transition, uh, it's a really great space for that. And then I also invite folks to email us. Um, We provide a lot of support, um, curated resources for folks who may have interest in terms of where to get started. We have a lot of YouTube videos, taking a look at a lot of different projects and questions that may come up if you're embarking on some kind of transition type project. Um, I also want to plug our resilient and ready together guide. And this is um, kind of a practical guide for disaster preparedness and response in your communities. And it also invites you to really assess the fact that folks who are already the most vulnerable and marginalized in our communities will often be those most impacted by disaster. So really keeping that in mind. So if you're just seeing your disaster preparedness efforts as getting a go bag, then maybe you're kind of missing the point. 
taking a look at how we can advocate for houseless community folks who are food insecure. All of those things are part of our disaster preparedness um, work. And there's some, you know, some practical ways that you can get started with that as well. So definitely the website. And then, yeah, I invite folks to, to reach out more directly if they have more specific questions. We love to pair folks up, especially if we take a look at the region that they're in with other groups who might be doing similar work and that y'all could benefit from a conversation from. So we were able to pair up a group in South Kingstown, Rhode Island, who was taking a look at some composting projects they wanted to get started and actually help to facilitate a conversation with Transition Town Media, who had that successful municipal composting program. And that was really generative. So we're, we're happy to do that kind of stuff for folks as well. Your organization has a really interesting model in which each of these entities at the local level are independent and autonomous in some ways. So how can you speak more about that relational part and that networking? And, and in particular, yeah. what I'm really curious about is the politics of this all. It's one thing to have action on the ground. It's another thing to change the politics such that the outcomes lead to the visions that you all have. Can you speak to that politics mm-hmm. and, and, what, and the, pol- the political nature of this? Yes, I think all of this work, at least in my view, is inherently political. And I'll, I'll also recognize that throughout our history, we've had certain folks, certain voices within the network who, yeah, who felt wary of transition becoming more of a politically oriented organization. Um, they found that, you know, being a very positive kind of solutions oriented group was a really welcome respite from maybe more protest centered work. And I think that these comments are also coming out of a larger strategic process where we, you know, we had conversations with, with folks in the network and really were assessing where is transition? What are we offering? What's kind of missing? Um, and what we recognize is that we were definitely missing in terms of representation across the network in general. Again, there's specificity to acknowledge here. But in general, seeing that most of the folks who had time and energy to put into organizing these projects trended towards older, white, middle class folks because they had the time, you know, the, the time to do that kind of work. So, again, this has prompted a deeper exploration around, you know, social justice, for example. And I came into the organization as they were doing some work to really reorient and reset and center social justice as being a really important way of seeing the landscape of issues and opportunities we were working with. So Regeneration Nation is our three-year campaign running from 2022 to 2025. And that's focusing our work, again, to center social justice, create more opportunities for youth leadership or honor and uplift youth leadership that's already just doing amazing work across this country so yeah i i think the politics for now and i'll 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 be very transparent we're actually reassessing kind of some of the criteria for becoming a transition initiative and we're taking a look at how to kind of tighten up our regional organizing strategies so that we can really, really create space for power building. Power building meaning like, again, how do we get together resources? How do we get together and leverage our networks and influence so that we can create the spaces that we need to continue to foster the work and help it to grow and to become more interconnected with this bigger picture of work that's happening as well. So there's transition work that's happening that is not being done by transition groups. And we want to honor that and see ourselves, again, still as part of this like emergent, we're calling it like, or describing it as the regenerative communities movement. And so that's kind of what we're honoring more as opposed to who's the official lineup of transition group. It's more so let's reassess so that we can provide better support for folks who are looking to start these projects. And then really, because one of the places where there is burnout is when folks feel like they're not being successful, right? So then really sitting with, okay, what does success mean? Why aren't we being successful? Why aren't we seeing more, um, you know, diverse kind of voices being represented in these spaces? And how do we address that? Where do we go to meet people where they're already at and what they're already working on? 
So these are all questions that we're holding right now. And it is really fascinating. So we also have a, an MOU, for example, with the Transition Network. So we're kind of our, our own thing, but we're still connected to the spirit of the principles that have come to define the transition movement, which are heavily influenced by permaculture design principles. And subsidiary being like finding the appropriate scale of decision making is kind of one of the important ones there. I want to uh, follow up on something you just mentioned, which is the idea of success. I think a lot of listeners would be interested in what is working and why. It sounds like you all are exploring that. And of course, there's huge variation depending on the local and regional circumstances. But do you have any thoughts on just some of the elements that are super important for local work to be successful? Yeah, I think one of the most important steps that we're finding that successful groups have taken is really mapping and understanding the 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 larger network of relationships that they're come that they are a part of already. So before they've even decided to get some kind of transition initiative or you know project going, there is already work happening typically in a place that should be acknowledged, that should be, you know, you know, leaders um, within a community should be should be consulted often. And I also think about that especially with um, building strong and meaningful relationships with tribal communities and with folks doing that kind of work. What are what are the folks who are often the most vulnerable and closest to the harm? Well, they're also closest typically to the solution. So what are they already advocating for? And how can we effectively leverage things like positionality and privilege in support of those of those needs? So I think community asset mapping is a practice that I highly advocate as well, advocate for as well as kind of personal network mapping. Like who, what communities am I a part of? Who claims me? Um, what are my relationships and responsibilities to these different networks look like? Where are their alignments? Where are their different patterns? And then again, seeing that from the community kind of scale uh, or the municipal kind of regional scale, like what is change actually looking like right now? And then having that can be really inspiring or also very clarifying in terms of like, where's their real need? If you're in a community where there's not much happening that you would describe as kind of transition type work, all right, then then there's some real need there. And there may be some different approaches that may, may need to be taken there. One of the challenges is always you know, reconciling the differences and sort of the outlook and vision of different groups. And I, you know, something you mentioned earlier is you all are working a lot on uh, social justice. Some people would argue that, yeah, social justice is fine, but what we really need to do is just not have as many carbon molecules in the atmosphere. And that's where we need to focus our attention. And, and so there's this notion that all those different elements are sort of individualized or demarcated. What's your counter argument as to why social justice should be enmeshed in all of these discussions and all of these different projects? That's, yeah, that's a really important point. And I think a really way of visually representing that is what we've typically come to see at like the, the COP, something you have COP26, where you have most of that space being held by by fossil fuel interests. Um, I'm thinking about indigenous communities from all over the world who gather in kind of a resistance with allies, you know, students, young people who are like, this is not, this is not cutting it. This is not enough. And I'm sorry, I'm quickly, for, I'm like going off on a tangent. I quickly forgot the question. Well, it was mostly, it was I mean, some, of- yeah, some people just argue that social justice is something separate, that, that, you know, dealing with climate change is one issue, social justice is another, affordable housing is yeah. something different. They're all sort of separate. And it sounds like to what you're saying in your organization's sort of framework is that actually those things are all tightly interrelated. So how do you make an argument to somebody who has the, has the notion that we need to work on all these things separately? Yeah, I think we can see that working on all of these things separately actually hasn't really worked. And I think that's kind of the deep reckoning that we need to have. Like, look at the design of our economy, right, where we measure things like or emphasize things like GDP. But within that GDP, you know, we're not taking into account things like ecosystem health, community health and well-being in a direct and centered kind of way. And so we see the real impact of that. Social justice for me, you know, folks can can describe and and politicize any way that they want, but it's like it's honoring the inherent value and human potential of every single person on this planet 
And in this kind of time, we need everyone supported. We need everyone um, able to contribute to greater resilience of the system. And I think that for me encapsulates what we are describing as regenerative. How can we heal? How can we create emergent opportunities for us to end up in a place far better than what we could imagine at this point? Because I think like I, I was reading the IPCC, you know, brief or whatever recently, and it can get really bleak. And there's really powerful language in there around the need to center equity when we're talking about the necessary changes that we need to make to confront climate change and really have a chance. And it again goes back to the to the fact that this, the, the most impactful solutions are staring us right in the face. They're typically in the form of how we honor the relationships and the deep interdependencies that we all have to one another and the places that we that we call home. So really encountering those histories of again, genocide, of Jim Crow, of all of these kinds of ways in which we have created policy that essentially gives us a green light to dispose of a particular portion of the population, be it poor people, people of color, queer people. We, we have those encoded into the design of our system. And I think that's, again, the deep reckoning and conversation that can be really, can be really challenging to navigate because it's just, it's the water that we swim in. So again, I think that's part of deconstructing the fact that we are, we are, we are living within the design of a, a white supremacist, capitalist, you know, system and the design. And, you know, it, it comes with a very real cost. And I believe it comes at the cost of our, of our collective humanity. That's how I see it. And that's why I think social justice is absolutely essential. And if we hyper fixate on, you know, sequestering the carbon, I mean, there's, there's plenty of brilliant papers that have been written challenging that notion and all of these techno, techno fixes that are supposedly, you know, going to help us engineer our way out of the problem, thinking about things like geoengineering or whatever. Those things, that alarms me. <laughs> that's, um, yeah, that's, that's throwing in with a way of seeing and, and operating that has shown itself not to be successful towards our, towards our highest aims in this kind of a time. Yeah, that's really interesting. And what you're really getting at here is the crossing part of crossing the chasm. I'm wondering if you have thoughts, if you had to just like really succinctly say, how do we cross this chasm? What are the words or ideas or notions that immediately emerge for you? Crossing the chasm, I think, so again, going back to, to healing, I think our relationship to land is is something that I continue to return to um healing that relationship and recognizing how that provides some of the foundational architecture um that has allowed us to yeah just um rationalize uh fragmentation and commodification dehumanization i think that that's really important and that's a big thing like (laughs) just looking at the influence, for example, of, of real estate in political elections, I think is really interesting. I, I'm really inspired by folks who are working again on community land trust projects or um, working to put forward rights of the earth or rights of nature, if you're familiar with that. That's a very innovative, like, legal solution. Or, yeah, we're, we're challenging that notion that land is is just a commodity or private property that land is actually the earth, this whole that we cannot fragment and that it comes with its own inherent rights and right to life um, and well-being. So I think that crossing the chasm, that relationship to land and then um, our relationship to things like the constitution, you know, we keep track of what different political parties and how they kind of, give homage or like continue to honor the aura of this particular yeah this like this tool that carries a lot of meaning for what this country is about I think that is something that should be discussed folks have talked about what it what would a constitutional convention look like and we're typically terrified of that because the right has their own kind of plans and I'm just saying in general like what would a really beautiful process around recognizing 
the constitutions need to evolve and adapt for like times it couldn't even have anticipated really. And, and like what, what, what process design would, would come into play if we wanted to have everyone's voice represented in the reimagining or redesign of something like that. And I get, and that connects to like a relationship to institutions is this kind of a design where institutions, yeah, like continue to, yeah, protect the status quo. Is that, is that going to cut it? Is there a different way of relating or different kinds of ways of organizing ourselves that we need to prioritize more now more than ever? Um, so those are in terms of the, the learning and like the healing and scary, like what does that look like? That's what I'm seeing in terms of the, the chasm. This is all really super thought provoking and interesting. I really appreciate you sharing. I, I want to just end with a couple of questions that you can reflect on and uh, and think about them not in the context of the actual work day to day you do in your career, but just more broadly. And the first one I want to ask, and you've already spoken to this a little bit, but what do you uh, see in society that is really inspiring to you that, that gives you inspiration, gives you some joy, gives you some energy? Um, I think I'm really inspired by anyone who would, you know, dare or not dare to call themselves an artist. I think especially during the pandemic, <sighs> movies, TV, performances, all and any number of offerings like really help to kind of, yeah, just, just remind us of the things that we want to protect and to celebrate. I've also provoked us to think about the things that we maybe need to leave behind. I was really into the show Succession. <laughs> My partner and I really would watch that. And shows like Yellowstone, like I reference pop culture a lot because it's what like a lot of it's what a lot of us are into and watching and it can provide kind of a a shared frame of reference depending on where we're coming from. But I think art deeply inspires me. I'm inspired by folks who call themselves artivists who are really using art to build community to create opportunities to imagine alternative futures. I'm a huge fan of Adrienne Murray Brown, their approach to organizing work and bringing in the creative, the magical, all of that um, is really inspiring. I'm inspired by youth um, who are really, oh my gosh, like really rising up considering, like in a beautiful way, considering the really heavy burden they've been handed. Um, it's unfair. And so I really think about, I think about that as a mom too. And just that's part of my, my praxis and my, my way of being in the world is to provide support to young people who are coming up in this work wherever I can, thinking about the little ones and thinking about, yeah, moms in general, caregivers and parents, just everything that, that folks are giving. And uh, I think that that brings me back to yeah, just the fact that we need to do a better job of honoring that beauty and that potential and, and really pushing for the design of a society that has that built in front and center. So, you know, I like to think about things like basic income and what that could really look like if we did it well, so that folks weren't compelled to put themselves on the, you know, on the market, but that they could meet their basic needs and have the extra space and capacity needed to serve their communities, to create beautiful things, and to just be at ease and find joy. So folks who are creating space for joy, for, for celebration, um, folks who are putting themselves on the front line. There's just, an, there's for me, I'm always humbled by and so heartened by the fact that I, I kind of do have an endless stream of inspiration because there's folks who are showing up every day doing this work and it looks different but it's all related. It's all connected. And so that's where I kind of put my focus is how do we connect these things? How do we know each other more and how to really support each other to get through these times so we can cross, cross this chasm together where no one is left behind. Have you listened to read or seen anything that really challenged your views or made you think differently? Hmm. Are you talking about like recently or along what kind of line? Open to you at any, 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 any scale is fine. Hmm. <sighs> well, I mean, I'll go back to the IPCC report, right? I have a deep love 
for science and folks who are really doing that work to think deeply around the complexity that defines our world. And my, my father is a, a science guy and grew up um, when he was a student at UC San Diego, like going to visit him at his genetics. He was part of some kind of genetics research lab. So anyway, reading that report, and it's, again, tremendous work. It's really, it's really hard to sit with it, the data overload sometimes. So I think in general, things that I'm challenged by are how do we make academia more accessible? How do we bring the ivory, ta- uh, ivory tower down to earth? How do we bring these institutions back to a sense of rootedness? in place, in service to people and the planet. So I'm challenged by things that can get really abstract and have no plan to like, or maybe a need for for a better way to kind of ground it so that folks can relate um, in a real way and feel like they can can have something to offer instead of just feeling like things are going over their head. It's way too heavy, way too complex. I might as well just not think about it. Because I think that tends to happen now. I've had periods of needing to detox from the news and and do all of that, but that only I can only do that for so long. So I'm like, we need a real way to to translate that stuff um, so that it doesn't it doesn't lead to overwhelm. And I think a big part of that, as well as our own relationship and orientation to the tsunami of data that we get to have access to on the daily, and this also bridges into challenges around my use of technology. So, like, I need my laptop. We use video calls for transition work because, you know, folks are all over the country. It's amazing. Like, I'm never not a nerd and, like, grateful for the Internet because it's such a fascinating thing that we get to use. And I'm also super cognizant of the fact that a lot of these tech giants, these platforms that we're using are, are extractive. And, you know, just the energy consumption in terms of maintaining all of these different servers, you know, reading some stuff about like the servers that help to power Wall Street, the amount of energy they use and stuff like that. Um, so technology, I think, and then how do we make complexity more accessible and meaningful and relevant to folks, I think. And then lastly, all of this can be totally overwhelming. I'm wondering, um, yeah, what what do you do that helps bring joy, that brings pleasure, that um, gets you out of these spaces of darkness? I think returning to our bodies is something that we need to practice on the daily. Yeah, I think especially for a lot of us who have the privilege, you know, of, of sitting down to do most of our work and thinking, you know, using our, our brains a lot like that's we need to get back into our bodies because that's not the only way it's not the only valid way of of thinking about the world of processing it I think really being in our bodies really honoring our creative expressions whatever that may look like for us is really important and then for me just like being with my kid even if we're doing like we'll you know we'll play video games together and we'll play outside and kind of sit with a tree and, and just kind of breathe together if we can, being as present as we possibly can and returning to our bodies. Those are practices that I think have been really helpful for me during this time. And again, I'm, I'm super privileged in that I get to walk outside my door and get to look at redwood trees and be reminded of how big it all is, but also how it all makes sense and that it's, it's going to be okay. And I, I remember looking at these trees, too, and always feeling fear around them burning down because of the fires that we experience here in California. But then I'm also reminded, like, this has always been part of the landscape and the ecology. And being reminded of that from indigenous folks who who remind us that we've lost kind of that relationship and balance. And so that's why we are experiencing these massive wildfires uh, or forest fires as opposed to kind of more ma- manageable fires when the land was more directly tended. So I I think, yeah, like tending to oneself, be it self-care, tending to a place, whether it's, you know, sometimes we'll pick up trash, we'll just take a bag with, you know, with us on a walk and 
my, my son is really excited to pick up trash. He sees it as his responsibility because this is a beautiful place and he loves it and he loves the animals here and he's going to take care of it. So, you know, shout out to folks who are raising kids during the, uh, during the Anthropocene. <laughs> shout out to you. <laughs> Well, Jessica, thank you so much. This has been extremely thought-provoking, and I'm really grateful that you took the time to talk with me today. Absolutely. It was a, it was a pleasure. Thank you, Brian, uh, and thank you to all the folks who are listening. Have a great day. I hope you all found that as inspiring as I did. I really loved the way Jessica talked about the problems, but also focused on the ways in which we can move forward in a productive way. I found that super interesting and insightful. And I am going to come back to this episode again and again to get more inspiration from it. I want to thank you all so much for listening. I want to also thank the executive producers of Crossing the Chasm, Dan Phillips, Cody Bayless, Chris Flores. And I'd also like to give special thanks to Anodyne Diversion for providing the music for this show. Thanks so much for listening. I hope you tune in again. Take care.